Okay, good afternoon, everyone, or morning, depending on where you are. Could be evening. I am uh, Harvey Miller. I am the director of the Center for Urban Regional Analysis at The Ohio State University. And I'd well, like to welcome you to the last event in our webinar series for fall 2023, Just Treat, Safe and Equitable Mobility in Our Communities. This series was co-sponsored by the Kerwin Institute for, on Race and Ethnicity here at Ohio State. And today's guest, Veronica Davis, will share elements of her book, Inclusive Transportation, A Manifesto for Repairing Divided Communities. And she will share her vision for the future of the transportation industry. I am your host for the event. If you require closed captioning, you'll find a box at the bottom of the screen called CC. Click the box and hit select subtitles. This will allow you to see the subtitles during the presentation. Uh, please feel free to submit questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A box, and we will ask as many of your questions as we can. If we run out of time and don't get to your question, we apologize. If you have any additional questions following this event, suggestions, or would like to contact us, our email address is cura, C-U-R-A, at osu.edu. This event is approved for one AICP CM credit. To, contain, to claim your CM credit, log into your My APA account at the APA website and enter the event into your CM event log. So as I mentioned, this is the last event in our fall 2023 20, series on just streets, safe and equitable mobility in our communities. I want to thank the speakers, Destiny de Guzman, Jesse Singer, Jesus Barajas, and in advance, Veronica Davis. And we also thank the Kerwin Institute on Race and Ethnicity for co-sponsoring the series. Stay tuned for spring 2024 series. This will focus on climate change in cities and there's more to come and just stay in touch with us. Follow us on Facebook, like us on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, we're still there until that implodes and we decide what, where we're going uh, next. But there's many ways to get a hold of us, including going to our website, cura.osu.edu. And there you can sign up for our newsletter and also check back at many of the exciting events and activities we have at Cura, the Center for Urban Regional Analysis at The Ohio State University. So I wanna get started now turn and uh, introduce Veronica. Veronica O. Davis, PE Professional Engineer, is the Director of Transportation and Drainage Operations for Houston Public Works. Veronica has, has nearly 20 years of experience in engineering and transportation planning. She's been a, 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 not only a leader in practice, but a thought leader during that during this 20-year uh, this, uh, career. She co-founded Black Women Bike and was recognized as a champion of change by the White House in 2012 for her professional accomplishments and advocacy. Veronica serves on committees for the Transportation Research Board, the Board for America Walks, and as well as technical advisory boards at the University of Maryland and Cornell University. Her new book, Inclusive Transportation, a Manifesto for Repairing Divided Communities. And I really wanna recommend this book sincerely. It's a really well-written book, lots of great you know, um, turns of phrases, things you tweet or, or memify, um, very clear message, very digestible. It's the kind of book you might hand to like someone in your local planning department or maybe to a city council person that really gets to the heart of, of the matter of how to, it takes a really hard look at uh, planning, how planning for a world of cars has harmed communities and how that affects anyone working to change things today. Um, she asked the question, how do you repair a system that continues to divide communities? And in a world where equity can seem just like a buzzword, what does mobility equity and mobility justice truly look like? So I'll turn the floor over to Veronica and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is still morning here in, uh, in Houston, um, but thank you for the uh, opportunity. Let me get my screen up and running. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm Veronica Davis. I'm gonna be talking about the long game. I know that while this is open to many people across the nation, I know there's a lot of Ohioans. Is that what you guys go by, uh, Harvey? Ohioans, Ohioans, uh, sure. people from Ohio? Buckeyes, whatever. <laughs> Buckeyes, there we go. Um, which is a very similar context um, to Texas, um, despite the size differences, but just the challenges are the same in terms of large vehicles. Um, you know, it feels like they're getting bigger and bigger. Uh, in terms of sometimes uh, misaligned philosophies uh, between the state and the city on highways, on movement, on people, and all those things. 
And so with that, I'll talk a little bit about the book. Uh, so my personal website is veronicao.com. And again, as long as Twitter X is around, I'm at Veronica O. Davis. Uh, I am today representing myself and not the city of Houston, um, but there may be questions about Houston and I am glad um, to answer them uh, to the best I can. Uh, a little bit more about me. Uh, I shared with people, I'm from Maplewood, New Jersey. It's a little itty bitty town uh, right outside of New York City. Um, but the thing about Maplewood, it is a older suburb and so it was built um, before cars. And so it's a very walkable town. Uh, most of my life uh, was spent walking or biking to where I needed to go. Um, this is my little downtown area, which uh, today that speed limit is 15 miles per hour. I, in the entire time that I live there, don't ever recall any crashes or any fatalities, um, but because it was recognized of you know, a people first town. Um, and really kind of on the cutting edge of many of those things. Uh, even the street that I live off of now has bike lanes. They're not protected, um, but there are bike lanes. Um, but I think it's just a testament of a town that was built uh, prior to cars uh, and everyone commuted into New York. And so it definitely formed um, for me growing up, uh, the freedom I had even as young as you know eight and nine years old to move around my town independently without fear of being struck and killed uh, by a vehicle. Um, so it was a really great place to grow up. Um, if, for, if ever, depending on how old you are, uh, for the older people on here, Andrew Elizabeth Shue went to my high school. For the people who are around my age and have heard of Lauren Hill, she graduated my high school. For the younger people, SZA uh, went to my high school. And my high school is the founding of Ultimate Frisbee. Um, and it's actually also one of the oldest in the nation. It's one of the 17th oldest high schools in the nation. So that's a little bit about how I grew up. Um, as mentioned, I am the co-founder of Black Women Bike. Uh, while I'm no longer in leadership in the organization, um, it has been a really great expensive, uh, experience. I never set out to find the organization. That organization kind of found us. Um, it, it started around 2010. Um, I had actually started biking to save money. I'd started my own company. And anytime you start a company, it takes time to earn money. And so I did my best to reduce my personal expenses. So I got rid of my car. Uh, I got a bicycle. And that's how I was getting around my bike and public transit. But even public transit has a cost. And so with that, you know, talking about uh, biking and uh, I started uh, talking on social media with two of uh, the co other co-founders and um, I was sharing a story about this little girl that was like so excited to see me biking through her neighborhood. And she's like, mommy, there's a black lady on the bike. And this is a public housing community. It was a little black girl and you realize the importance of representation. So we started using the hashtag. And so it started as a hashtag in May 2011, grew into its own movement. And so it still exists today. Uh, many women in Facebook. And then most importantly, beyond just biking, um, it was really about advocacy. And it was a really about getting women biking for whatever reason. So it's not just about putting on the Power Ranger suit and going out and trying to get in mileage. We had a lot of um, uh, programming around just biking for transportation. Like, How do you bike to the grocery store? You know, there's bike to work day. Do you even know how to bike to work? And so being able to help assist people to think about, you know, what's your, what would be your path to work? What do you actually need to bike to work? In the winter and at night, what do you need to be visible at night? And so we did a lot of programming around that. And really what's probably the most exciting part about Black Women Bike is the fact that the membership skewed older. We got a lot of young retirees, um, people, women in their late 50s, early to mid 60s, um, who were young retirees who wanted to stay active, who were on fixed income and wanted to reduce their you know, household expenses. And so not many of them joined Black Women Bike and got back on bicycles. And what's really exciting is many of them actually went on to become certified instructors in cycling and getting other women biking. Um, and so that is just part of the story. And again, it was you know, being the founder of that, but then recognizing when I need to step back and out of the spotlight and to allow some of the older women, uh, to allow some of the larger women be the face of the organization so that people can see, oh, I, I can do this. She looks just like me and I can do that. Um, and so it has been, uh, it's been a great organization and I'm glad that it's still around. 
Uh, this is me as a child. I like to always have a picture of me as a kid. I think I was a cute kid, number one. Uh, and two, I'm trying to touch my toes. Um, and I have since improved, but I am a certified yoga instructor. And so I do share that little piece of me because one of the um, principles of, 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 of yoga is the yamas. And that's basically how we treat the outside world. And one of the elements of the yamas is ahimsa, which is non-harming. And that's what I attempt to do in my work um, as an engineer, as a planner, of how can I deliver a project that does no harm to this community, particularly in communities that have been harmed over and over and over again. It's what can I do to repair that harm? What can I do to make things better? Um, so a little bit about my book. Hopefully you have purchased it. If not, it's not too late uh, to buy a copy. Um, and I'll just give a brief overview um, of the table of contents. Um, so it, I started writing this journey in 2018. And so it's laid out, um, the forward is by Tamika Butler. Um, she, if you, if you haven't heard of, of her, she's a super awesome person. Um, she's school, currently in school at UCLA, um, but she wrote my forward and I'm honored to have her do that. In the preface, I talk a little bit about the experience of writing a book and the doubt that comes with it. Because um, I think that there are times when you feel like, well, what do I know? What do I experience? But I think having both my professional and lived experience is an important thing to share. And so I do talk about kind of the anxiety around that as a as in the preface. I also talk about having this particular job and the fears around some citizen, you know, highlighting my book and then like sending it to me in an email and throwing my words back at me. And I was sharing with Haru before we got started of how I've had to actually go back and reread my own book um, and hold myself accountable um, in this job as long as I sit in this seat. In the introduction, I just frame um, the industry, where we are now, how we've gotten to where we are, and some of the challenges. And I even touch on technology. I think that Right now, it's everyone's AV, AVs, AVs, um, but that's only a piece of it, and it doesn't solve kind of our core issues. Um, and I know that some AV companies have started to pull out of cities um, because they're looking for very neat, discrete decisions that, the, that these machines need to make, not understanding cities are chaotic, and that's what makes cities great. It's the chaotic nature of a city is what makes it great. And so then I go into the six main chapters. And so from a big picture perspective, um, uh, each chapter is formulated as, you know, providing some thoughts that I have. Um, I provide case studies and I'll go through one case study um, in this particular talk. And then I end with opportunities for reflection. So this is not a book for you to highlight and be like, ooh, got a couple nuggets and you put it on the shelf. I hope that this is a book that if you all purchase it, um, that it, you carry it around with you, that you open it back up as you have different experiences. And so I start off with the person. Transportation is personal. I share my transportation story, um, both of my family and losing property to a highway. I share about growing up in Maplewood. I share about being a black woman um, in this particular industry. And then I invite you as a reader to talk about your story. Why do you make the decisions that you make? Why do you care about transportation? Whether you're actually in the industry or you're just a very super interested citizen, like truly investigating those motivations. Because the more you know about yourself, the easier it is to then be able to relate to others. And chapter two is equity is more than a baseball graphic. And so that's the graphic of, you know, the kids trying to see baseball. And so it's like everyone, equality is everyone has the same. So everyone's the same box, but the shorter persons can't see over the fence. And then uh, there's e equity is everyone gets what they need. Um, and that's when everyone has a, a box that's appropriate for them to see over the fence. But I toss that entire graphic out to say that it really comes down to prioritization because cities don't have the people don't have the time and the resources to actually meet the needs of citizens. And so we have to do prioritization. In chapter three, just a tongue in cheek, should there be a war on cars? Um, and it just talks about the impact that cars have had both on our public health um, and our overall natural environment. And it is not to say that people should not have their personal vehicle, but it's what are we doing to actually facilitate um, people being able to make other decisions. So for people who do want to take the bus or who do want to walk or who do want to bike or do want to use the scooter, what are we doing to safely facilitate their ability to do that? In chapter four, 
uh, power influence and the complexity of people. I'll get in that to a little bit, um, but it just talks about our stakeholders. And what tends to happen is you get the um, some stakeholders that show up to every meeting. Anyone who's ever been to a public meeting, you know exactly who's gonna show up. And meanwhile, who is always being left out of the decision? And so that type of a framework. And chapter five, it's bringing it all together. So I know there may be some students on here. Um, there may be young professionals that are on that are listening today. And so part of the challenge is we hear about the importance of public engagement. We may even put together public engagement. But what tends to be missing is how does the public engagement actually inform the planning process or the design? How do we actually link those two together? Um, how do we actually address people's concerns? And so I walk through that process. And then lastly is chapter six, which is the task ahead. Um, for many of us in this space, uh, what we need to do to uh, advance the conversation and hopefully shift the industry. So just a little bit of framework for those of you that don't know. So if we think about the timeline of our highway system. Um, so actually, you know, I know that people give Dwight Eisenhower a lot of credit, um, but really 1916 was the first federal aid Highway Act, and that's what created the state highway agencies. In 1939, we had the interstate, which is the first described as the Bureau of Public Roads. Um, what's really kind of cool when I worked for Federal Highway Administration was able to actually find documents that still had that old emblem on there when we were the Bureau, when it was the Bureau of Public Roads. Um, the 1944 was the Federal Highway Act, and the 1956 was really the first time there was funding established for highways. So we do wanna give Dwight Eisenhower a lot of credit um, for actually funding um, the ability for this nation to build highways, but there were things that happened before them. And so I think part of this highlights is transportation feel like it's always been slow. Um, we were slow to get started, slow to get funding, and even now we're slow for implementation. Um, and so this is the highway system. Um, this is a map. I think this one was from uh, the 1950s when we were they were laying out kind of a vision for how to connect the nation by highways. And so some good has come with that in terms of the um, ability to move commerce, the ability to move people around the nation. Um, but also it's very important to frame this same timeline as highways are being planned, as highways are being discussed, the other things, the cultural side of what was going on in the United States. And these two things really can't be divorced. Um, so as you know, we had a civil war in this nation. And while uh, revisionists want to say that the civil war uh, was about uh, economics, the civil war was about the right to own people, like full stop. And, uh, and, and so with that, you know, we had a civil war in 1965, but right into that, we went right into the Jim Crow era is what it's called. And that was separate, but equal, which really was separate, but unequal. And that's where um, in the nation, you see, um, you know, the whites only, the colored only signs that went up. And, and, and that was the, was the backdrop of all of these things. Um, you also had the introduction of redlining of where people could and could not live, things that were happening very blatantly. Um, this is very well documented. There's actually a, a congressional document um, that talks about the impact of the real estate industry in perpetuating segregation. Um, there's a book, um, The Color of Law, that actually goes through in most cities in very detail about the actual redlining that happened and the segregation that happened. And then around 1955 is the beginning of the civil rights era. So I think sometimes we can focus on Martin Luther King and I had a dream. That was like, you know, decade into the movement that all of that happened. Um, but you really have the civil rights era with the end of, you know, kind of 1968 of the Civil Rights Act. And so that's an important backdrop for how we have designed our systems. Um, and so this is one uh, graphic I really like to use. Um, we talk about the American dream. And so this is, um, you know, a place where people can be prosperous, that people can and do all these things. But it's the American dream layered on top of Jim Crow. So the first um, definition of American dream was about 1931. Um, that's the first time you hear this terminology. Um, then you have the war that happened. And as vets came back, 
uh, white veterans were actually able to get funding from the federal government to have housing and to be able to move places. Um, and you have Levittown and all these things that were created around then. Um, and you have this vision of an American dream. But again, this is layered on top of Jim Crow. So the American dream wasn't for everyone. And the other thing I just want to make sure it's very clear for people, because I think sometimes we can look at history with the current lens and it doesn't work. So in 2023, what the definition of white and what the, the definition of white in 1950 are very different. So you have to also keep in mind that during this time frame of the American dream, people who were, of, who were Irish, people who were Italian, people who were Jewish were not considered white. I think that is that has to be crystal clear. So we might consider them white today in 2023, but in 1950, they were not. They were immigrants um, and there are protective covenants. So even as we think about redlining, protective covenants on deeds and deed restrictions, it included people who were Irish, Italian, Jewish. So it included black people, but it also included other people. Um, and then even as the Asian community uh, continued, began to grow in the United States, it included them as well. So I think it's very important to keep all of that framework that white was very specific. It was white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. And if you did not fit in that box, there were protective covenants to keep you out of neighborhoods. And so this is a Google and this is a screenshot of my computer. And all I Googled was American Dream ads. And so these are the ads. This is the dream that we're selling. And what you see in almost everyone, it's a, a, a wife, a husband, a little boy, a little girl, either a cat or a dog, um, and the vehicle and their suburban dream. And so that is what happened. So you started seeing white flight, very clearly the WASP community. So you started seeing the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants moving out to these suburbs. And so in that case, we had to facilitate their movement back downtown so that they could get to work. And so that's when you need, you have a need for highways. And so these are the ads. There's one ad that includes people of color and it's this one um, from 1937. And so in the backdrop, you have the world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. And again, it's this ad of a white family with their dog in their car driving to the suburbs. And in the line, you have people in this, you know, people of color um, in this line waiting for food. And so that's how decisions were made. And so again, this is just for Houston. They have these for all over of all the different systematic segregation, particularly redlining and protective covenants. And as much as people want to revise or uh, do revisionist history, these things are factual. These things are very well documented for how people could live where they could live. And that's why even if you look today, you do see very much the same patterns from before. And so this is a map uh, of 1960 of East Baton Rouge, and that's where my mom's family is from. And so this is at the time that they were planning the Interstate 10 through Baton Rouge. And so it's kind of faded now, so it's from 1960, but you see a map of this highlighted area of where they were thinking of, you know, building the highway. And so this is, uh, you'll see an arrow that points to a parcel. So the north arrow parts to a, uh, where my great grandmother's house was, and the east arrow points to where my grandparents' house was. And that's the house that my mother, who's very much alive, very much in her right mind, grew up. And when she was in high school, uh, the government purchased, um, don't know if it was fair market value or not, um, but they were relocated essentially to build I-10. Um, my mother went to um, St. Saint Ca Francis Xavier Catholic School, which is around the corner, where the community, and this was a uh, Black and Italian community at this time, um, had just you know raised all this money to build a brand new high school. So my mom was the first class to attend the high school, and she was actually the last to graduate. Um, because they tore down the high school to build the highway. And so these are just the overall impacts. And I, I say this because I think that, again, sometimes these things can feel like they were so long ago, but there are people today, um, my mom is in her 70s, there are people today that remember what the community was before the highway tore through. So whether you were a Buckeye, whether you were Texan, whether you were a New Yorker, 
there's all these communities that have been impacted by these highways and there are people alive today that remember what it was before. And so this is a picture of my uncle in front of my great grandmother's house. And uh, what's really key to this, for me as a child, I visited this house. So even as, again, we think about these impacts, I, and I don't think I'm that old, I'm mostly in my right mind, um, but uh, as a child visiting my grandmother's house under the highway and my grandmother, great grandmother's house was the only house that wasn't taken. Um, the rest of the block was completely decimated. And so therefore a family that was once on the same parcel, they were split. And so my grandparents had to then go across town to visit my grandmother. So where they could run through the, back, the houses in the backyard, now they have to drive across town to visit each other and the impacts of that. And where my family was able to walk to church, which is still very much my family church today, now they have to drive 20 minutes in order to get to the church that has been my family church for a while. And this is what it looks like today. So this is a picture that was taken in 2022. So it may look a little bit different now, but this is what it looked like in 2022. So where you see the tree, um, that's where my great grandmother's house would be. And then in the background where there's the slightly darker pillar of the highway, that was my mom's house where she grew up. And again, it's just a reminder that people today uh, remember what things were. And so I take this into uh, one of the case studies that I provide. So this is me a couple years ago, um, where it's like, you know, if you can imagine the voice like, I bet you're wondering how I got here. I have no life in my face. I am ready to go home. I absolutely had a glass of wine after this public meeting. Um, but this was a public meeting that went terrible. Uh, we had an overcrowded room. Uh, we had uh, black parishioners who were vehemently opposed to the project. We had white bike advocates who were for the project and everyone was yelling. And then the media shows up. So of course with media, everyone then amps up the conversation. Um, and then, but for by God go I, the meeting was shut down by the library police. And so this is when I learned that DC public libraries had their own police department, but the library shut it down. And as much as, you know, you're like, it was almost like thankful uh, that it was over and we had an opportunity to regroup. So what happened? So I had a project that had a lot of stakeholders. So this project is, I do talk about this in the book, it's in the District of Columbia. It goes right through the heart of the city and touches different stakeholders. So at the Southern end, you have um, access to, you know, you have the museum. So if you've ever been to DC and you have all the different museums, the art museums, the history museums. So at the Southern end, you have the museums. At the Northern end, you had um, Howard University, which is a historically black college or university. So you had Howard University at the Northern end, but in between you had a bunch of different land uses. So you go through downtown DC, which is very dense, lots of office buildings. You have the, I think it's now the Capital One Center, uh, which is where the um, Capitals, uh, which is the hockey team, and the Wizards, which is the basketball team um, uh, play. So you have them, uh, that basketball arena right in the center. As you go north, you have the convention center where you have a lot of different events that are happening there. You have a little bit of public housing. You have a lot of historically black churches um, that have just kind of been there through everything um, from Jim Crow all the way through um, the riots um, and protests in 1968, um, through the crack epidemic in the 80s and 90s. They have just been there the entire time. You have row homes. You have high density homes um, and then you get to the top and you have small mom and pop businesses, mostly owned by immigrants um, who've come and reinvented themselves in schools. So it's a lot going on with the different stakeholders. Um, and so some context, uh, this is a one of my favorite um, uh, uh uh, magazine, uh, not magazine, newspaper covers. So this is from 19, uh, 2012. This is a cover in DC. And so you see this big headline, motorists fuming as bicyclists pack roads. Everyone is angry at clueless bike share riders. And you see this picture of a man, you know, with gun lights in the background, he's holding his gun up. But that's about Libya. 
And so it's this really kind of interesting like war on cars conversation that's happening. So you have this big headline and you have this photo that has nothing to do with the headline. Um, but it just gets to um, the sentiment that was happening in DC. People felt like there was a war on cars of you're trying to social engineer me to not have a car. And it's like, no, it's not about you. You can continue to drive. We're trying to accommodate the people who want something else. At the same time, um, particularly around this time, DC was growing very fast. Um, there was a point in time that DC was growing by a thousand residents a month. And so when you look at the population, um, in almost a decade, the DC's population jumped by 100,000 people. It was just, just this constant just growth that was happening. Um, and then with that growth, you had a change of demographics. So what was once what people call chocolate city was starting to come cappuccino, maybe a cafe au lait. So you had this racial kind of undertone of everything else that was going on. And so an additional context with this particular neighborhood, you had rapid development. And so this is a Google image on the left from 2019 of what was once a market and it was shut down because it had, um, there were several murders around there. Um, in this area, you had a lot of uh, drug selling and drug use. Um, and so you have, um, if you can see people parking on the street, there was a lot of uh, vacant properties where people could park. And this is where a lot of the churches parked. And so in 2019, what was once church parking is now buildings. Um, and you can just see the overall development in under a decade. And so with that becomes a lot of anxiety of where do I fit in the future and a lot of conflict. So where the churches had parking, they were losing their parking. Um, and where they were used to double parking was then becoming an issue. So then parking became this kind of pressure cooker in this neighborhood and these tensions between the different groups of, you know, the church parishioners who had been going here for generations and generations and new residents. And so back to this moment. Um, so the bike lane became the thing that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And it really wasn't about the concerns. It was really, uh, we had never addressed kind of the issues head on. And so where people couldn't stop development, where people couldn't stop the anxiety around all these other changes, they could fight the bike lane. And so the bike lane became kind of the, the um, mechanism or avenue that really brought all of these like strong emotions out in people. Um, and it is a lot of lessons to be learned from this. So to me, it's where we went wrong. So number one, the process was unclear. I think that for many of us that work in these industries and work in these spaces, we work, we've done these projects and we can get into our planner speak, our engineering speak, um, but we don't take it to a, well, how do we explain this in a living room setting? Um, and so it was unclear. So people thought we were showing up tomorrow with bulldozers. Meaning while we were at, literally at the beginning of the project, trying to talk to people, trying to understand the concerns, um, but there was a lot of anxiety because people didn't know what the process was. And so much had happened to this community over the last decade without their input that they were just like, it, it was just a lot of anxiety around this project. Um, two, we didn't really address the problems of the community. So this is a challenge with this project where we, it was a bike lane project. We were trying to do a protected bike lane, but there are portions of this area that don't even have sidewalks that are forget ADA compliant, that are just anything. And so it was very hard to sell this idea of a bike lane when you haven't even addressed the fact that I can't walk down the street, forget about a wheelchair, like just a, a able-bodied person could barely get down the sidewalk. And we didn't address it. Um, and we didn't address that walkability. So then you have people that are, so it goes back to the idea of needs, of I've expressed to you what my need is. And instead of addressing my need, you're giving me a bike lane that I don't need. And I might support it if you actually address my needs first. So it's like the kind of infrastructure version of like Maslow's higher needs of like, how do you actually do that? And that's the barriers. We didn't address the different barriers in the community of, of how do we actually move, get people on board, but we just didn't address any of that. And then lastly, we didn't address the elephant in the room. And so again, that was the overall just tensions in the neighborhood. We never, we danced around it 
You know, we put the rug on the elephant and hope nobody would notice, but we never addressed it. And it's one of those things that just kind of blew up. And so I do share about this in the book of how I would do things differently today, um, how we handle these things. And I think sometimes as engineers, as planners, we don't want to deal with the cultural stuff, but the cultural stuff is actually part of mobility. It's part of our urban areas. It's part of our cities. It's part of our communities. Culture becomes very important. And when you don't address it, it can blow up in your face. And so part of it is if I were to do this again, you know, number one, it's about acknowledging people where they are. Um, we never did, you know, good, bad or otherwise. We never really acknowledged that. We ever never acknowledged like, hey, what's going on with you? We never gave people the space to talk about their frustrations. And I know it feels like, but what does it have to do with the bike lane? But it does because the bike lane itself is not that hard. You know, it's not that, you know, the dimensions a I have and I've done this as a guest lecture and I've even done it with high school students and high school students with zero engineering can design a bike lane. It's not that difficult. It's all the other stuff that makes it very challenging. And so really meeting people at that space and helping them get there Two, it's working with the communities to identify what some of the barriers are. Um, and again, it's one of those things of I wish we would have never had a you know kind of open house public meeting, but actually um, taking the time to go out and take a block of the street to show people kind of what it would look like. Because I think the other thing is a lot of people can't read maps. A lot of people um, can't, you know, even if you do a rendering, it's, it's still hard for people to see it and what they see as the street today. So taking that time. And then breaking into smaller increments. I think that this is one of those projects we probably should have tackled, you know, the lower half first that went through that that wasn't in the residential areas and then come back and tackled the upper part. But instead, we tried to eat everything at once um, and it made it a very challenging project and a longer process. And so with that, um, so in my book, I do talk about that. I talk about the task ahead and um, and how we can actually do better projects. And it may take a little bit longer to get through the engagement process, but we can end up with a better overall project and get everything done. And so with that, I know that there were some questions that were submitted in advance. Um, so I look forward to the Q&A. Oh. Okay, thank you very much, Veronica. Appreciate that, all those comments. Very nice summary of your book. Um, and I want to remind the audience that we will be accepting questions. So this is submit them through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And uh, until we start getting some questions, I'll start off with a few. So as I mentioned during the introduction, this is a very well-written book and has some really um, powerful statements in it. And one of the ones is at the very beginning of the book, you say, show me a transportation network and I'll show you the values of the decision makers who designed it. And then a few pages later, few pages later, you're describing um, tech companies and mobility space and how they're um, disconnected from the communities and from the problems they're trying to solve. And you also say the same thing about, about traffic engineering so and how, how they operate. It's like they're disconnected from the communities in which they're trying to solve problems. So how do we daylight these implicit values and biases in our transportation decision making? Ooh, um, so it's, I know that's a loaded question. Um, so part of it is some of it's just going to be obvious. Um, if you look at any city, uh, most cities now, um, because of Vision Zero, have done a high injury network. Um, and that, for those that may not know what that is, um, that is um, the places where um, people are, the crashes that are leading to death and serious injuries. And when you look at that high injury network, it probably is going to tell the same story in almost every city. It's probably a four lane undivided road. It's probably an eight lane road. Um, it is likely in a place where the space between traffic lights is so far apart that people are mid block crossing unsafely, but it makes sense because people are, um, you know, attempting to get across the street to get to their bus. Um, and then when you layer on demographics, if you look at where people um, have asthma, if you look at where there's obesity, it all overlays. So that's where it's like, if you just show me the network, I know your values. I mean, it's right there. Um, and when you value car movement, um, you, car movement and people are diametrically opposed. And I know everyone talks about finding the balance. 
And I'm very honest, even here, it's, I can't find balance. Either people are gonna die and cars are gonna move efficiently, or we're gonna prioritize people and they will, I will, they will move, but they may have to sit through an extra light cycle to get through the intersection. So which is it? Um, and it's and it's hard for people because, you know, constituents complain when they sit at a traffic light, you know, for even one light cycle, and 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 it becomes a challenge. And so, I think it's those type of things of, you know, within the, your community, the data is already there. It's bringing it to light. It's telling a story about that. Um, and particularly when you can get stories of lived experiences to support the data. Data is, you know, is one piece of it, but what's the overall impact? And so when you look at, um, yes, there's this big wide road and there's a bus, so it's a complete street. But when neighborhoods tell you, I can't, I can't get across the street or I got to walk a half a mile out of the way to get to a signalized intersection. So it's, you know, wrapping that story around the data to be able to, you know, bring these things to light. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I, but I also want to point out that you know some of these biases and values are uh, baked into the way we do things. You know, such as the manual and uniform traffic control devices, the MUT CD, or the Green Book. You know, from the FHA. These mm -hmm. are um, the, these are like codified ways that we design streets and the where we put stop signs and crosswalks and things like that. How do we? break that stranglehold because a lot of times when I talk with transportation and traffic engineers, they'll just say, well, that's what the MUT CD says. And yet it, that that seems to be something that we just are having trouble moving beyond some of the values that have been baked into, into codes like that. How do we change that culture? Well, I think it's a couple things. So the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control uh, Devices, MUTCD, um, there's there's really actually whole, not a whole lot of shall statements. There's some that are like, when it comes to regulatory signs, like stop signs, like, oh, stop sign over here, um, mm -hmm. like stop signs, it's very crystal clear. Um, but there's a lot of wiggle room for engineering judgment. I think what comes in um, to play, it's there are times when you, for, for traffic engineers and particularly for city engineers, when there's so much that needs to be done it's you don't want to tell somebody no so you lean on these kind of documents to be like well i can't and it's not that there isn't a problem it's there are just other areas that just have bigger problems and nobody wants to hear that so sometimes and it's a little dirty secret it's a little bit easier to just be like oh mutcd and there are times and, and, and to be clear there are very much there are some shall shall not statements in the mutcd but there is a lot of space for engineering judgment i think the other piece of it is um, you know, engineers by nature are risk adverse. I mean, it's it's probably one of the riskiest professions. Um, if a planner makes a mistake, it's like, eh, engineer makes a mistake, you lose your license. And so therefore, again, it's easier to just go by the guidelines than to like risk sometimes engineering judgment. But I think that how do we get there? It's we need to have better guidelines. Um, and I know that um, as mentioned, I, I serve on the board of NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials. And so they have an urban design guideline, street design guide, and a few others. And they are um, updating right now the bike design guideline. And that's where it becomes very important. And then I will share in the city of Houston, you know, we have actually taken those design guidelines and updated our own um, infrastructure design manual. Because if you can fix the design guidelines, it takes away all that gobbledygook because then people feel like I have a little bit of protection. Um, so we've done that. And then even from a, a traffic engineering perspective, you know, level of service, level of service. Um, and so that's, a, you know, kind of a metric where in traffic engineers look at the capacity of the roadway versus the volume of the roadway. Um, and so you give a great letter, A, B, C, D, E, F, and F is you failed and you have complete gridlock. And so people think like, oh, well, I need to have an A. Like, no, you don't need an A, especially in the downtown area. Um, but with the city of Houston, we are moving, we just adopted a multimodal level of service to look at all modes. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the efficiency of moving vehicles. Can people get across the street? Can bikes get across the street? Can buses move? So really thinking holistically about um, how we define capacity of the roadway. Well, that's interesting. You actually anticipate the next question I was going to ask. I was going to talk about in your book how you mentioned justice and the restoration of communities that have been harmed in the past by transportation infrastructure. 
and he talked about the need to develop metrics that lead to restorative justice. So maybe you could tell us a bit about what's going on in Houston or maybe what you know more generally. How do we build this, these kind of metrics and history into our um, in transportation pl planning projects? It's um so it's tough and I'll give um and I'll give a really great example. I'm dealing with this now and hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. we will be wrapped up in a few weeks. But in 1960, uh, the city of Houston, I was not alive, so I didn't do it. Um, but in 1960, the city of Houston built a roadway through a cemetery. So it's called Evergreen Negro Cemetery. And bodies were removed. I don't know where they were reinterned, and so that's part of the story of we don't know where they where they were, um, but we are working on a project now. So if, if you can kind of think about it, so there's um, a cemetery today, our roadway, a really wide esplanade, another piece of our roadway, and then the cemetery. So we basically split the cemetery in half. We've been working with uh, one of our partners on a major BRT project. And so with that, this kind of has bubbled up. You have to do the archeology, span you have to do the history. And so we looked at the Esplanade and have discovered um, 33 burial sites inside of the Esplanade. So in 1960, when remains were supposed to be removed, they were not all removed. Um, so we found 33 burial sites with at least three partially or intact remains. And it's very easy to go, well, nothing to see here, cover it up. You know, we've done our due diligence, check, check, check. Um, but it is to us about how do we do the right thing um, for this particular community? And, you know, part of it was we had a press conference where the mayor accepted his responsibility on behalf of the city of Houston. He didn't do it. He wasn't even alive, but he accepted, you know, responsibility on behalf of the city of Houston. Uh, we will be um, going through the process with the state, but we will be removing uh, the remains. We will take them to be tested to identify gender and identify age. And then um, we will also do DNA samples so we can run it through public databases to see if we can find, um, you know, next of kin that are alive or if people want to volunteer. Um, and then we will have a reinterment process. In addition, so that's kind of one piece and we can say well, that's our mitigation for NEPA and that's what NEPA requires us to do. But in addition, we've been working with the cemetery to build um, so really nice brick wall um, as a gate and as an entrance to the cemetery, um, which we probably should, well, we shouldn't have built it through the cemetery in the first place, but we should have done this in 1960. And so we're doing that now um, and hope by the end of this month to do a kind of blessing ceremony of that. And so that to me is restoration of how do you go beyond, we've done this harm, we could do the bare minimum required by law, but how do we go beyond? And so part of our going beyond is to really celebrate um, this particular cemetery, and then working with this nonprofit to also tell the story that we can put markers in the public right of way that continue to tell the story of this particular cemetery, who's buried here, the damage the city did, um, and the ownership we took. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll turn to a couple of questions and I encourage more from the audience as you uh, continue to listen to this discussion. Here's a question from a listener. Um, I live in Northwest Washington, DC. How do you balance improving the infrastructure and access to bikes, protected bike lanes, capital bike share, and areas that are already better served when other areas seem less well served but also seem to have less demand? You know, ideally you want to improve it everywhere. How would you advocate it for improving those places that are already accepting of it? No, but would you advocate for uh, improving in places that are already accepting of it? How do you move on to uh, to get to those areas that have been neglected. With some of these so projects. I see the from the listener. It's a name I recognize. Hey, Mark. Um, so I'll say this. Um, so one, uh, Houston has taken a different approach. So many of our protected bike lanes are actually in black and brown communities. We do have a lot, and and I live in a neighborhood that is very well served by bikes. Um, I live off of two trails. We have a lot of rails to trails, just given the amount of rail that we once had in Houston and still have. Um, and so we do have some really great um, trails around the city. But in addition, um, we've been working very closely with our county um, uh, commissioners, and we have a really some of our better bike infrastructure that's on street is frankly in black and brown communities. And part of that is working with those communities, because um, understanding that there's a need of there are people who don't have vehicles, 
there are people biking today. And so we have installed a bike lane um, where it's great to see little black kids um, using the bike lane to just get around, to hang out. Um, so where it comes from, for us, we got lucky in, in having an advocate and a elected official over that area who wants to make this level of investment. Um, we have gotten lucky in having a mayor that has this vision um, and having that level of investment in black and brown communities. And so, you know, in one of our nicest trails actually goes through the middle of Texas Southern University, which is a historically black college. Um, it goes through the middle of their university. Um, and so it's there. So in terms of how other cities, how you can advocate, it's not that other communities don't want bike lanes. It goes back to the need. It's how do you as an advocate show up for the, what do they need? And part of it is, Many of them are like, look, fix the buses first. I don't like, I, it's not that I don't want the bike lane. I use the bus, and my bus doesn't come on time. So how do I get the bus to come on time? And so it's about building those coalitions um, with different groups that are on the ground in different neighborhoods that have a need. It's building the coalitions and it may be people outside of the transportation realm um, to help, I, help advocate for the things that they need so that then you can get to the bike lane. And it feels jaunting because it's like, oh, it's a lot of work. But that's why it's the long game. It is how do I bring, how do I ensure that this community has what they need, the, the baseline need, so then we can get to this other set of needs. Got it. Okay. Um, hope there's nothing going on there. I hear a siren. Maybe that's just. I had no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, here's a question from a, a listener. And I think, you know, I think I, I'm sure I know the, what your answer is, but I want you to, it actually leads into an important point you made in your book, which is about the diversity needed in transportation organizations. So the, the person asks, is it important to have diversity in engineering and planning in order to understand the cultural issues that communities face? And you, you actually discussed that quite a bit in the I book. I so do, I do. I address it twice at the end of my book. So in chapter six, um, I talk about one, there is a need to diversify the field, full stop, end of discussion. You know, we need to, and that means, you know, people of different cultural backgrounds, um, that means people of different abilities, um, whether someone, you know, we work very closely with the, op the mayor's office of people of disability, um, and the director happens to use a wheelchair um, to facilitate movement. And so it is important to have all different types of people at the table um, on your team. But I also say it's not an out um, to rely on it, because then what tends to happen is there's an over-reliance on these people, from, people from a community and I do talk about in the book that you got to do some of your own internal work. And that means being in spaces where you are completely decentered. And then I think for many people, um, you know, particularly, you know, white men, I'm just go pick a y'all, love you. Um, but, you know, what tends to happen is, you know, we talk about um, mantles, right? And so those are panels of all men. And no one notices. Women notice, you know, it's like, wow, y'all couldn't find one, just one, you couldn't find one. Um, but to men, they're completely oblivious. We're just having this conversation. And because many times in these conversations, that's the dominant culture is male or the dominant culture may be white or depending on one of those things. And so when you live in the dominant culture, everything just feels natural to you because the world has been built for you um, versus when you're not in a dominant culture. And now you're being accommodated in different ways. It, it's a different experience. I mean, I think we think about Americans with Disability Acts. We accommodate people with disabilities, but when have we ever designed a conference that actually we designed the conference around someone with a disability and then the rest of us kind of live in it. And so I do talk about um, going in places where you are completely decentered and observe, observe all the different things. You know, one of the things that's been great to see is women take over leadership. Women's transportation seminar had childcare at their conference. Like that is huge, right? You think about women and the ability to participate, they are usually the primary caregiver. You know, even when there's two working parents, women are usually the primary caregiver. So even to just have access to childcare to be able to go to a conference is a big deal. And so that's what I mean by decentering certain experiences. Um, and that's incumbent upon all of us. To do that, you know, when is it? Have you ever been to a disability conference? Like, go to a conference that is geared towards people with disabilities and just sit in the back, observe, observe the different how the conference is laid out, 
observe the sounds. Uh, we had the National Federation of the Blind, and it's very loud when everyone is low or no vision. It is very loud because vocal is how we now have to communicate. And so everyone's yelling something, and you're like, wow, this is really loud. And we realize our audible pedestrian or accessible pedestrian signals aren't loud enough. Um, and so now we had to go back, okay, well, let's tweak our signals mm -hmm. to make sure that they can adjust to any noises around. Um, so I don't give an out. So yes, diversity is important, but individuals still have to do their own work to decenter themselves and understand you can't, don't overtake, but just understand someone else's lived experience to just raise your consciousness. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, another question from the audience is about um, electric scooters and how they complicated how, how have they complicated how bike lanes are used. Maybe you could talk a bit more about micro mobility as well, because that's something else you bring up in your book about um, kind of like tech bro projection, which is why we have scooters in the street. So maybe you could talk about the issue there. Well, I think there is a space for scooters the same way electric bikes are um, an important part of micro mobility as um, studies have shown it allows people to bike further. Um, and there's been studies to show the overall impacts that electric bikes actually are very great for people and they're biking more. Um, so I think there's a space for it. I think where it comes down for us is well, now how do we create a lane that can accommodate a child, because I think I, I believe in building cities for kids. So how do you accommodate a small child that is going to bike and wobble while in the bike lane and the ability to pass? And so therefore, we maybe have to rethink some of our designs. Maybe a two way cycle track doesn't facilitate that safe movement of both a micro something that's micro mobility and something that's, you know, leg powered. Um, and we maybe need to do wider bike lanes. I know for here, uh, Houston, our standard now is six foot and it has to be fully protected. That is our standard. And if you deviate from that, it's got to be a darn good reason why. And that's not to say that we don't, but it's got to be a, a very good, compelling case to why we can't make that. And therefore, it allows for two people to bike side by side. It also allows someone to bike and wobble while someone else passes them. Hmm. Wish we had that standard here in Columbus. I will, I will pass that on. Um, here's an interesting question from, from another uh, person in the audience. Um, what new approaches can be utilized to move families rather than individuals reliably in urban areas? I see a good amount of innovation geared towards moving young singles in the city, but not as much at moving families. That, that's a really good question. What's your answer? It's a great question. And, you know, I'll say I think the electric cargo bikes are um, becoming some people that second vehicle um, for the fact that you can put small children on a, you know, cargo bike. You can still go grocery shopping, you can still do all of those things. But again, the facilitation part is one, they're very expensive. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a used cargo bike and I put an electronic kit on it. Um, but, you know, for a good quality electric bike that you can get multiple three kids on, um, you're looking at six thousand, seven thousand dollars. Um, and so what are we doing to help subsidize that 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 that, um, you know, as a government? I know that there's a lot of subsidies if you get your electric vehicle. But where are we subsidizing e-bikes as it really becomes um, a method for people to be able to, for families to be able to move, especially with small children? For me, most of the time on the weekend, if I'm moving around with my child, we're on the bike, we're on the e-bike. She chills in the back with her sippy cup and we, you know, we, we get to going. So I think that is you know, one big thing um, of consideration. But also with that, it's how are we also changing the other standards? Because now you have to think about bike parking. Of Are the bike parking spaces wide enough for an e-bike? Because you know, these cargo bikes, because cargo bikes are pretty wide. Um, whether you have the, the the kind of box in the front or the extended in the back. So now how do we have to think about um, bike parking? So I think that there's conversations have, I know DC um, has relooked at some of their bike parking uh, for new uh, standards in order to accommodate some of these bigger, larger bikes. But I think as we see this industry continue to grow and hopefully the prices will come down, or the creation of the used bike market that makes it more um, affordable for people. But I definitely think there's opportunities um, to do, you know, credits or um, something, you know, for being able to use these. Okay, uh, we're just about out of time, unfortunately. I could go on for another hour with you, but um, oh well. 
Um, so um, thank you very much, Veronica. This has been a really interesting talk. And again, audience, I highly recommend checking out her book, Inclusive Transportation. You'll find it very, very powerful, very succinct, and, and really a, a, a good framing of the message, a very important message. And uh, that concludes our speaker series for this fall, 2023. Stay tuned. We'll be formulating a new speaker series in the, in the spring centered on climate change and cities. And uh, we look forward to that. Follow us at cura.osu.edu and um, take care, have a happy holiday and um, be safe out there. Bye everyone.